So, um, as it happens, uh, technology has its own way of uh, dealing uh, with us. And uh, rather than being live, this um, meeting is recorded. And uh, I will be uh, uploading the recording of the meeting afterwards on the various platforms where you should have been seeing it live, but I am sure it is not going to be a problem because rather than being on episode number 3000 with 3 million followers, we are on episode three with three followers. And uh, even though the experience of uh, being live is exciting, uh, the desire uh, of uh, understanding the world and acquiring knowledge and being able to act on it is uh, strong enough to overcome any kind of letdown that not seeing me live uh, has potentially provoked in all of you. Um, searching for the question live is about understanding and sharing our knowledge. And I have started it uh, just a few days ago as an experiment where the first episode was about the uh, tools uh, that actually I am using and that uh, uh, have decided to misbehave today. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, second episode was uh, understandably uh, about uh, the pandemic that uh, right now has a billion people closed in their homes uh, in uh, the attempt by their respective governments to slow down and enable them to manage the, the epidemic. And I am actually talking from uh, Bergamo, uh, Italy, which in a completely unexpected manner, uh, to me at least, uh, became the epicenter of, uh, of this pandemic. And uh, uh, it was um, really uh, incredible to, 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 to see that. Uh, the uh, opportunity uh, is uh, really great for, as I said, sharing knowledge, understanding the world, and I invite you to subscribe to my YouTube channel, uh, like my official Facebook page, Searching for the Question, follow me on, on Twitter. Uh, I am David Orban everywhere, easy to find. And Today's episode was supposed uh, to be dedicated to an introduction to exponential technologies that uh, we are all getting familiar with, except that the technology that forces us to get familiar with the mechanisms of explosive growth of certain phenomena is not an artificial technology. It's a natural technology. Those viruses because the COVID-19 pandemic has exponential features in how it is spreading. That is why we are ill-prepared in perceiving its threat, underestimating it until it is too late. And then we react uh, uh, in a panicky manner, oftentimes caused by our ignorance accompanying the measures that we take by other things that cause damage as well. So exponentials are important and uh, I have been um, neck deep, if not uh, uh, completely immersed in exponentials for 15 years at least, as well as other people. So. As it happens, uh, today I um, corresponded with somebody who is in a different field, but very much uh, uh, in this area as well. Uh, and we decided that rather than me uh, on my own alone telling you about uh, the things that I just mentioned, we would have a guest on searching for the question live, and that we would use 
the specialty of this guest to illustrate the concepts of exponentials or even of super exponentials. And uh, this guest is uh, Roman Yampolsky, who is uh, an associate professor uh, at the Speed School of Engineering, uh, the director of cybersecurity laboratory uh, at the University of uh, Louisville, uh, and a, 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 a well-cited scientist in the field of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, behavioral science, artificial general intelligence. He also published a gazillion books. Uh, I have a couple of them. And uh, of course, I will have many, many questions uh, to ask uh, Roman. But of course, uh, these questions are not only going to be about uh, his books like Artificial Superintelligence, A Futuristic Approach, or the more recent uh, artificial intelligence, safety, and security. Uh, but rather, I would say the first question necessarily and appropriately will be, how are you, Roman? How are you and how is your family? I'm good, thank you. And uh, I guess it's good evening, Italy, and uh, good day, US. I know you are in the epicenter of things, and we might be in a similar situation in a week or so. so. How are you doing? Um, it has been just incredible, really astonishing, uh, like a, 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 a boring and frightening television series by Netflix or Amazon Prime, where hour after hour, nothing happens, which is very lucky. But you know that there are a lot of people who you don't see, but you hear about, and they are dying. Eerie, really eerie. And some of us are disciplined enough to detach themselves from the unrelenting uh, news that are accumulating both locally and globally. I don't feel I can do that and that I should be doing that, um, but uh, it is psychologically really hard. So I have a lot of recommendations uh, for Americans. Uh, first, don't underestimate how heavy this whole thing is. Do stay home. Don't leave home unless once a week or maybe once every two weeks you go grocery shopping, and many other recommendations. But one recommendation is steal yourself because it is going to be heartbreaking and psychologically very, very difficult to maintain your balance. Thanks for this advice. I think we've been doing a pretty good job lately of staying home kind of hard to get kids not to try to go play with neighbor's kids, but uh, other than that. Okay, I am very happy to hear that. And uh, it is, uh, of course, beautiful at the same time that we have these advanced tools, also part of science fiction, just like the horrible pandemic situation that allow us to reach out to friends, uh, people who uh, uh, we have interacted with in the physical world, but to know that our uh, digital tendrils are connecting and are strong uh, without the internet, this would be even harder. Um, I think surprisingly, I'm getting more social as a result. I'm connecting with you after not speaking to you for a while. So in a way, this uh, isolation is shifting from my local connection to people who may not be chosen for anything other than being my geographical neighbors to being uh, my intellectual friends, my counterparts around the world. So in a way, it's uh, promoting better, stronger connections between neurons instead of uh, connections based on geography. 
The first time we met was at uh, Singularity University. Uh, you didn't have a beard at the time. Uh, I was trying to grow it, and surprisingly, in San Francisco, I was told it's not appropriate to have such weird physical expression. <laughs> well, let's not go into um, talking about how the snowflakes feel uh, the necessity to be offended by so many things, including facial hair, uh, uh, as, it, as, it, uh, uh, as you tell me. Uh, and then the last time we, we, we met uh, was a year ago uh, at uh, the um, uh, Future of uh, Life Institute organized uh, conference about artificial general intelligence, safety and security, you know, straight in your uh, specialization. Uh, a conference that originally was uh, sponsored uh, by Elon Musk, um, and uh, he may still be providing uh, donations, but he is not personally involved anymore. Uh, Max uh, Tegmark, uh, uh, the founder of the Future of Life uh, Institute, is very much uh, involved, of course. And this is an invitation only conference in beautiful Puerto Rico that. Uh, has uh, maybe a hundred people, maybe a little more, dedicated to analyzing for two, three days, uh, four days if we include uh, also the workshops, both from an academic point of view, a scientific point of view, a research point of view, an implementation, an engineering point of view, but also from the point of view of uh, uh, policymaking uh, um, ethical uh, decision making, as many facets as possible, how advanced artificial intelligence, super intelligence, artificial general intelligence need to be designed so that it is compatible with a positive future for humanity. So, uh, did you go this year? So I think it's only every other year. Oh, okay. Sorry. It's not an annual event, but uh, because if they have one, I hope to attend. It's a highlight of my uh, social interactions for sure. Absolutely. Uh, that, that's that's exactly the case. I was I was humble enough not to uh, manifest uh, my inner tears when I wasn't invited this year. But you tell me it didn't happen, so you maybe could. I will invite it next year. There you go. <laughs> well, both of us are not cool enough to be invited every year, and that's what it is. And I will, I will totally accept it. I take every um, gift the world gives me uh, at its uh, face value, and uh, my expectations uh, are always exceeded. So to be there already was uh, was a great uh, for, was a great honor and and an absolute uh, blast because the conversations uh, we had and uh, the interactions um, as well as the speeches themselves uh, at the conference were were really magnificent. Now let's take a step back and please tell me and tell our uh, viewers and listeners. What is AI and what is artificial general intelligence? And, and why do I, and is it, is it correct? Is it appropriate that I labeled them exponential technologies? Right, so artificial intelligence is just our attempt to automate labor, physical, cognitive labor, anything people do, we would like to make machines do it for us. Uh, standard approach is to pick a specific problem and do it well, so maybe playing test. That's narrow AI. If you can do something which learns in multiple domains and can perform in multiple domains like humans do, that's general intelligence. And that's the holy grail of the field. That's what we're trying to accomplish. And uh, yes? Please. You were about to say, oh. And uh, all of them are digital technologies, which are exponential. The moment you have it, you can uh, duplicate it endlessly you can add more memory computational speed increases data training data increases doubles every 
couple months, year, whatever it is. So they grow exponentially in that regard. Now, I don't think AI grows exponentially in terms of its a kind of IQ equivalent. We're not noticing IQ doublings every couple of years, but that will change once we get to general intelligence. Once we have human level and beyond the ability to do science and engineering, this level of performance will likewise become exponential. At least that's what I think. So um, you said um, that AI that we teach to execute a cognitive task or a physical task, and then we call it robot, right? Uh, yes. Is a, a specialized AI, artificial narrow intelligence. Instead, an AI that is able to learn across several domains is artificial general intelligence. So a couple of examples, um, we were able to teach uh, uh, Deep Blue, the IBM computer, well, not you and I, but the IBM uh, engineers and programmers were able to teach that computer how to play chess. And that was more than 20 years ago, uh, and it was a surprise because a lot of naysayers uh, would never admit that uh, this would even be theoretically possible. There were a lot of people who would say um, human creativity is such an integral part of how to play chess at very high levels that a primitive mechanical machine, independently of how powerful it is, is never going to be able to accomplish it. But it did. Now, even AI practitioners were upset about the approach, which was based on brute force, uh, the computer being able to compute and calculate a lot of steps, a lot of uh, moves in a cascading branching tree that it would then prioritize in order to pick the move that it believed was the best. And Unfortunately, this is a recurring element of the field of AI, where as soon as you're able to do something, it stops being AI. Um, but would you agree that uh, it is correct and appropriate to label that as a kind of a watershed in, in the field? Uh, specifically chess? Well, uh, that, that we can point to that for anybody who says, Computers are unable to uh, match human capabilities uh, in a field of endeavor. And then we can, we can say, listen, I don't know about that particular field of endeavor because we didn't do it yet, but that is exactly what people were saying about chess. And we did match, and then we did greatly exceed human capabilities in chess, right? So that's one specific example, but there are thousands. You can start with a calculator. They greatly exceed humans and ability to do basic math, but nobody's impressed by that anymore either. Uh, I think the challenge is for naysayers is to come up with something specific, something they can describe where they would say a computer will never be able to do X. What is X? You tell me. Don't tell me big things, uh, fall in love or something you're not as explicitly explaining if you tell me what it is how you do it we can make it something an ai can do perfect and um, it was also surprising even to some of the practitioners of the field of ai that um, three years ago um, or maybe now four years ago uh, google DeepMind was able to design a, a, a similar program that rather than playing chess, played Go, which is a much more complex um, game. Uh, sorry, uh, the rules of the game are simple, but the combinatorial explosion of the possible moves uh, makes it much more intractable. And the reason why they were able to do that is exactly because they didn't take the brute force approach that IBM took at the time 20 years ago, but they took a more modern approach based on learning algorithms. Uh, 
So we could say that that uh, um, Deep Blue was taught how to play chess by the designers and engineers from IBM. AlphaGo, the first successful attempt by Google to beat uh, the uh, then uh, reigning uh, human world champion in the game of Go, was not taught. AlphaGo learned how to play Go. Would you agree with that? And if anyone disagrees, certainly with AlphaGo Zero, that's no longer a problem. Zero human knowledge. There you go. So why, why don't you describe, because, because I, I, I uh, didn't get into that detail. AlphaGo had a bunch of books to learn from, right? right? So and these books were... Both of them are neural the, networks. Both of them are oh. working as an imitation of human brain to a certain degree, but one was trained on lots of human games, access to data sets, opening moves, whereas the other one started with just playing with itself. And the brute force comes in the amount of play time it does. It played more games than any human expert would get a chance to play. But as a result, it learned to play better and in a very novel way, not the way humans play Go, which is in itself interesting. So, so AlphaGo learned based on examples, AlphaGo Zero learned based just on the set of rules by itself. That was the big difference. Experimenting with itself. So let me play. What happens when I do this move? I lose most of the time. Bad move. When I do this, things work out better. Let's try more of that. Do it a couple billion times. You're a really good Go player. So um, Deep Blue is teaching AlphaGo is learning, AlphaGo Zero is learning how to learn. Would you agree? Well, there is definitely a meta component to it. And because of it, they were able to reuse Alpha Zero in our domains, our game domains at least. Now, that is exactly the next step because Google, uh, uh, after a while, maybe a year later, uh, published the results of Alpha Zero. So Alpha Go playing Go based on examples. Alpha Go Zero playing Go, learning to learn how to be a better Go player based exclusively on the rules with no examples. Alpha Zero is able to learn to learn across different domains specifically Go, chess, and the third uh, uh, board game. So it learns to learn how to learn. Because it applies the same ability to different domains. The problem is it doesn't do knowledge transfer. It learns domains independently. The holy grail would be because it learned to play chess, now it's much easier for it to learn Go and so on. And there is good research in that direction as well. Fantastic. So back to my original question, what is AI and what is AGI? The reason why, if I ask you, is Alpha Zero AGI, you would respond, no, it is not, because my original definition of AGI being an AI that applies to multiple domains is incomplete because what I really want is the uh, knowledge transfer, the ability to take uh, what uh, the system learned in one domain and accelerate its ability to learn to learn in the other domain as well. Uh, that is part of it. Also, we still have to do a lot of supervision with uh, Alpha Zero in terms of what is going to train on, what the goals are. Uh, completely general intelligence would be independent in that regard as well. And so to, to do uh, 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 an unavoidably human uh, analogy is that uh, uh, the uh, hybrid human AI system uh, is, in a, is in a relationship such that the human is constantly tutoring or mentoring the AI system so that it stays on course rather than letting it roam free because uh, its its ability to supervise its own learning is 
still at an insufficient degree. Right, we provide guidance and direction, but our ability to do so decreases. We are less likely to be able to predict and explain more advanced systems. And as we become more advanced, we become more independent. And, and a, a lot of research is, is going in the direction of, of being able to understand the AI system themselves. Uh, it is a, a, a little bit uh, the, the crux of the problem that uh, if we design something that corresponds to our expectations of doing miraculous things, then by definition, those miracles will be so far from our level of comprehension that we will be astonished, but uh, totally powerless uh, towards them. So why aren't you desperate instead uh, you are um, feeling energized by this problem? Well, it's kind of like with this pandemic, right? We should be terrified and depressed, yet here we are, you know, talking about advanced technology and future of humanity. You have to compartmentalize uh, how you treat those problems. And I still think I have a chance of impacting it to where uh, negative impact would be minimized and beneficial aspects of AI will be increased. But uh, whatever is possible or not in principle is part of my current research. And, and uh, tell me a little bit more about your, your research uh, uh, to um, an audience that is certainly in interested in the field of AI, but they are not uh, specialists. They are not, uh, um, if they are software developers, uh, they do uh, full stack development uh, and not uh, um, uh, machine learning uh, or, or, or other things. Uh, if they are philosophers or, or ethicists, uh, they, they have uh, uh, their HR problems maybe uh, rather than uh, 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 taming uh, AIs. So uh, what, what do you do and, and um, how does your work going to impact uh, the trajectory of humanity's future? So I work on AI safety and security, and that's a field which is kind of a combination of cybersecurity and AI. How do we make intelligent systems which are well controlled? They do what we want, they do how we want it, and uh, they have very few side effects. They're unlikely to cause accidents and problems. And in that field, there are subfields. Some people look at modern problems, current problems, uh, algorithmic bias, technological unemployment, uh, I concentrate more on future, what happens to this technology in five years, 10 years, as we get to human level performance, as we get beyond that, super intelligent machines, can we control them? Can we predict what they're gonna do? Can we explain their decisions? And lately my research has been all about impossibility results in AI safety. It seems that there are very strict limits in uh, physics and mathematics, we all know about, but in intelligence, there are likewise limits to what can be done. Can lower intelligence ever fully control higher intelligence is a fundamental question of AI safety. And that's what I'm working on during this uh, lockdown period. Um, and and um, do you have a feeling that the, the, the results and the uh, constraints or the guidance or the best practices that you discover and document in your publications are starting to inform uh, those who are mashing their keyboards and happily um, implementing systems that start to do things that we interpret our, with our own moral and ethical lenses because we have had uh, over the course of the past few years, many examples of um, technology companies from Microsoft to Amazon to Google who demonstrated to be oblivious to the fact that they already have the power of unleashing, for the moment, narrow AIs, but still powerful agents that can do damage. Right, so 99% of computer scientists have absolutely no knowledge of AI safety as a field. They just want to make capable systems as quick as possible, release products, services, 
within AI safety community, there is very good level of understanding of my work and interest in it, and it's well cited. I think it has impact. Um, it's more theoretical than work of other groups, but I think as a result, it has more long-term impact. It may not be immediately applicable today, but then we start hitting those big problems in five years. That's where a lot of answers would be. And um, how, um, I mean, you being here in our, in my modest uh, way is a means of, of helping you reach a broader set of people, raise awareness. Um, if somebody said, I didn't realize, but this is actually important. Um, how can they go from learning about it to, to implementing it in, in some way in what they do? It depends on who the person is. If you're just a random person voting, by voting for engineers and scientists, not politicians, lawyers, business people, that's already a good start where money is going to be allocated, where research funding will go. If people understand those problems, maybe the big problems we face today would be better handled. If you are actually a computer scientist working in AI, then definitely read the literature, understand what the concerns are, what the problems are. It's not science fiction. It's not uh, completely far in the future. It's kind of like with this pandemic. Today you have zero dead people, and sick people, but you can project at that po uh, at the point where you're going to get overwhelmed, the uh, hospitals will go down and so on. And it's very similar charts here. I have papers where I try to collect all the AI accidents for now for narrow AI systems. And you can see the number of them, the severity of those problems is uh, exponentially growing, just like AI field itself. So your job is to make sure you understand those issues. So you brought up Microsoft as an example of a company dealing with some of this. Then they released their uh, pay bot, uh, ad bot for Twitter. They should have understood how it's going to be used and misused. If I read my papers, they wouldn't have this big embarrassment on their hands. So I think it's uh, fundamental. We, we require engineers to take an ethics course. We have to require AI researchers to take an AI safety course. At least they would know what not to do obvious problem. Maybe they're not gonna be experts to do advanced level of work, but at least they'll know some things are just bad. Um, as we understand more about things that we should be doing and things that we shouldn't be doing, is it plausible? And maybe is somebody that you know already working on making, um, I would assume, machine learning based evaluators that highlight either in a body of computer code or in a body of uh, policy draft documents, areas of concern. It, is that something that we could use in order to use AI to address this issue of uh, the lack of uh, uh, sufficient uh, awareness and and understanding and 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 certainly faulty implementations. We will definitely need AI to help us make better and safer technology. There are companies starting to look at it. In fact, uh, I am one of the co-founders for a company specifically dealing with AI safety for existing systems. How to make sure the code is safe. The code what is, is the safe. URL? Uh, it is very early stage at this point. I prefer not to advertise it. We'll wait a little bit and then I'll definitely spam everyone with it. But uh, the goal is to use the best practices, use uh, blockchain to record at least log some of the training taking place so we can do kind of forensic analysis on AI. That's another area which is not well developed. We know how to do forensic analysis of software, but how do you do forensic analysis of intellectual systems, going back to their maybe faulty data on which they learned. Uh, all of it is gonna become a much more impactful part of the cybersecurity industry. Now, as we uh, look at uh, uh, how we are improving AI, 
uh, I was really uh, stuck by a, a report that Stanford uh, University published um, last year, and then it was further analyzed and, and uh, described in a blog post by OpenAI, where they illustrated how uh, it would appear that uh, Moore's Law, which dictates the self-fulfilling prophecy of uh, ever-increasing computational power represented by the density of components uh, in the chips that, uh, that we build, which has been um, able to reaffirm its validity for 50 years and counting, in AI is actually regulated by a different um, exponential, it, where Moore's law sees more or less uh, the doubling of computational power every two years, they uh, plotted and then um, uh, tried to, to, to see what, what kind of uh, linear, um, uh, what, what kind of line could be interpolating those uh, plot points on a logarithmic uh, chart, so what kind of exponential that would, uh, that would draw. And, uh, and they concluded that the characteristic doubling for uh, AI compute, the uh, multiplication of uh, the uh, computational resources available and the time that, uh, that we have to, to deploy them, is instead of being uh, every two years, is every three, four months. And the difference is, is stark. Uh, if um, since 2012, when they noticed this uh, breaking point, we would have been uh, in the development of uh, ever more powerful AI platforms on Moore's Law, then today we would have maybe 30 times more powerful AI. Since we were on the doubling every three, four months instead, now we have 300,000 times more powerful AI, which is quite astonishing. Um, what are your thoughts about this kind of interpretation uh, of the data that they looked at? I suspect it has to do with funding in certain industries like biotech and uh, bioinformatics. We also see rate of improvement, which is better than Moore's law. And if you throw enough money at it and there is a definite benefit to being first to the market, it's not surprising. If there was an obvious need to have a much faster processor and huge financial gain right now, I mean, what we're doing here, email, video, is well supported by this five-year-old laptop. I don't have a strong need to uh, have something much fancier, whereas with AI, you need the best. You literally have to be the best to get the market. So I think that's what kind of skews the curve. You're not getting the same level of resources, so the curve improves. Um, I suspect, and we will see, that there is something more fundamental also going on. Um, similarly to how uh, Ray Kurzweil uh, looked at uh, his law of accelerating returns and took several examples, both in the industrial age as well as in the pre-industrial age. And he looked at how things were following exponential curves um, in, in many different uncorrelated industries. I believe that if we look at data coming from various areas, we would be able to identify not just one, but more um, fields of uh, science and engineering. And of course, with their uh, explicit impact in terms of uh, the economy and the benefit that all of this is bringing to, to humanity overall, that are not following exponentials anymore because exponentials are characterized by a constant acceleration, like, for example, more slow doubling every, every two years. But instead, we would see that 
these are characterized by an increasing rate of acceleration. And people who studied Newtonian mechanics will say, well, I would never thought that you would need uh, an acceleration that is not constant. I only used uh, uh, A, uh, which is the symbol of acceleration, as a given number. Um, Newton didn't need that. He formulated his laws with constant acceleration. But actually, um, in our day-to-day -day lives, we have variable acceleration, both in increasing and in decreasing. Every time you get in a car and you say it gets from zero to 60 in a given amount of seconds, that change in speed is not achieved at a constant rate of acceleration, unless you have very light feet and, and, and very zen-like control of uh, the symbiont between you and the car. Uh, what happens is that as we press the gas pedal, or, or hopefully ever more, uh, whatever we call the pedal that accelerates our electric cars, uh, the, the machine reacts at a variable rate which is also demonstrated by the Zeno-like paradox that if it stops accelerating, then it ex its acceleration must have gone from a given value, positive value to zero. Just like at the beginning, beginning when it starts accelerating, its acceleration must have gone from a zero value to whatever value maximum it achieves during the interval. So in our day-to-day -day lives, we have uh, systems of variable acceleration. And there is uh, the mathematical name even for this, which is called jolting. There is another name, which is called, uh, the, the first uh, derivative of acceleration can be called a jolt, or it can be called a jerk. But uh, I don't like the, uh, the, the gerundive of the second uh, uh, one, so I prefer picking the first one, jolting. Another example that I like to quote uh, are Elon Musk's rockets. Since they consume their propellant as they take off, the mass they need to accelerate with their engines at full throttle is diminishing and by Newton's law, if the mass is diminishing but the force is constant, then the acceleration will be increasing. Um, and uh, I searched it online, and the New York uh, MTA, the Transport Authority, in their employment agreements has specific clauses defining uh, that buses shouldn't jerk. And what is interesting about it is that our bodies are not made for being able to adapt to excessively variable acceleration. When you are uh, in, a, in an amusement park and you are um, very tightly uh, controlled, uh, you are not only wearing a belt, but your head is, is uh, restrained, is because in modern rides, you could snap your neck and your muscles uh, are not enough. Contrary to Formula One uh, uh, race car drivers, your neck muscles are not strong enough to withstand the jerking and jolting that uh, these uh, modern amusement park rides uh, uh, impose on you. So I um, formulated this concept of jolting technologies. And what I want to keep exploring is whether it is the case that we shouldn't attempt to interpolate those data points with a straight line on a logarithmic chart. What we should be doing is to find the exponential on a logarithmic chart that they naturally design because they represent jolting, which on a logarithmic chart is represented by an exponential or a double exponential on a linear chart. And, and the reason why this matters 
is because if we understand that, we wouldn't be taken aback and surprised and potentially disastrously surprised by the future results that unexpectedly advanced AI could produce. Very interesting. So it sounds like you're describing this point, that jerk point, uh, where it's a singularity or we hit human level super intelligent performance. Uh, that's where the current chart goes out the window. The curve is no longer a Well, let me do a whole new chart and let me let predict that levels of performance. Let me give you a prediction. If um, Kurzweil says that uh, human level intelligence is going to be available for the equivalent of $1,000 in 2045, and the maximum amount of money that you are um, able to deploy is going to give us human level intelligence uh, around uh, uh, 2028, I think, uh, uh, whatever his predictions uh, were, if I am right, he should look if he needs to revise those numbers in order to bring them uh, uh, closer. And all of us working in the field in one way or, not, or another should ask ourselves, what are the implications of this paradigm if, if I am right? Right. I think he did revise his numbers a bit, so they're more optimistic now. So maybe you should talk to him. Um, not not uh, recently. He is uh, busy at uh, Google doing his chatbots. Uh, did you see the latest announcement about a, mo a month ago uh, from do Google uh, on, on their latest uh, chatbot? A very good performance in terms of touring like uh, passing, touring like tests, right? Yes, uh, uh, it is. Um, it is uh, really. Um, what is it, Mina? I think it is called. Something like that. Yeah. There you go. Uh, let me share the screen on the fly, so our uh, viewers can uh, can see it as well. And and please, if you looked at it a little bit, uh, or in general, uh, what do you think of chatbots? Uh, so they get really good at fooling us into thinking they have intelligence. The whole language model produced by OpenAI is really amazing at generating this uh, very human-like looking text, but you have to keep in mind, they still have very, very, very little understanding of anything. In fact, probably closer to zero. So it's easy to get confused uh, uh, in any other domain, if you look at, uh, I don't know, robotic sex dolls, right? They look superhuman, very human-like, but it's a doll. There's nothing human about it. And it's kind of like that with this language model. They look, they read well, but you have to remember they are not uh, quite there yet, which doesn't mean that they're not going to get there in the next seven or ten years, but uh, it's something to keep in mind. Um, I was uh, uh, fascinated by uh, this chart because, uh, uh, you know, a, a, an engineer will always want to measure things as well as a scientist. And uh, when you publish uh, research in many fields, uh, uh, you are required to be able to say why your approach is superior to the others. And uh, in this uh, um, uh, paper, um, Google did design and apply new kinds of uh, uh, measurements uh, to both uh, past chatbots as well as to their chatbot. And it would look like, according to what they published, that Mina, uh, the Google chatbot, is just about 10% uh, inferior in sensibleness and specificity average. Uh, to a human. Now, it would require um, to um, us to, 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 to explain more in detail what the SSA um, uh, number or, or index means from zero to, to 100. Uh, but uh, if we go uh, towards what you said, that these systems are good at fooling you, at persuading you about being human, then uh, it is, of course, extremely provocative 
to the point that uh, uh, a large number of Hollywood um, uh, plots revolve around this, to ask oneself, what does it mean to be able to persuade at a superhuman degree, at a superhuman level? Because that is what we discovered both, as you very well said at the beginning, when we had pocket calculators, that they are unbeatable and unbeatably better at arithmetic than humans, and then with chess, and then with uh, image recognition, and then with Go. So what, how will we react when chatbots will be better at human than us? Better at chatting? I suspect it's kind of like chatting to an average human versus chatting to a very smart, genius level human. You immediately feel the difference. The level of understanding, humor, cleverness, people, meanings, uh, you can't compare it. And I suspect you'll get a lot of that. In fact, you can have a perfectly intelligible conversation to you, but completely miss a whole deeper level of conversation. It's like many people do with humor, for example. Many people can hear the same joke and laugh at it for exactly opposite reason. I love that. It's the best. Um, yeah, I, I mean, uh, your children are, are still small, right? And uh, mine are, are uh, uh, grown up. As a matter of fact, I'm always uh, complaining. Well, thank you. Uh, their biological programming worked. I just uh, did a little bit of my part. I'm trying to expedite it a little. Hopefully we can release them before 18. Uh, and and um, so what, 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 is, what is interesting is uh, to watch a, a, a cartoon with them that is a smart, well-designed cartoon and uh, realize, witness what you just described, that there is uh, a level of enjoyment and entertainment that they uh, gather from the watching of it. And then there are jokes that they don't get at all. Right. And so what you are telling me is that there will be shortly, maybe in 20 years, maybe in 10, maybe less, um, AI-driven interaction platforms where there are at least three layers or more. Average, very smart human, and then the AI, I am sure, will have its own secret jokes. I'm and, sure, and I think there are infinitely many levels. I don't think it's three levels. I think within super intelligence hierarchy, you'll have systems which around circles, around others as well. And the kindest of those AIs at each level will reach down and explain some of the jokes so that they can share a laugh with those of us who unaided wouldn't get them. And that's part of my research. I show that in fact there are certain things which can never be explained to a lower level of intelligence. So you'll never get those jokes. Well, uh, there are some of us that are ready uh, to interact and to strive. And striving and interacting is what drives us and to some degree, maybe large degree, defines us for being human. Uh, we strive in our daily lives. We interact while, like, like we did uh, today. And uh, there is much more to, to cover. So I hope uh, we will have uh, more uh, occasions to uh, sit down in front of a camera and, uh, and keep chatting. Roman, this has been wonderful. Thank you very much. And, and, and thank you for agreeing to come on uh, uh, the show uh, with basically no uh, advance notice, no detailed preparation. I, I had a lot of fun and, and I hope uh, you did too. I did as well. Thank you so much. And I wish you the best of luck in your current situation. Hopefully it's over soon, but if not, we have lots of time to talk. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great. Now, the good news is that uh, it was streaming, uh, not on, on YouTube, all the platforms, right? but it was streaming on YouTube. That's right. I also recorded it 
uh, and then I can compare the quality between one and the other. How many followers you have now? Four or five? That's right. Uh, Tell uh, my mom to follow you. (laughs) <laughs> well, I know mine does, but she doesn't speak English, so she she watches if my hair it is calm. She'll get it on a completely different level. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, and one of the reasons I have these last exactly an hour is because my wife is half German, and we sit down for dinner at eight o'clock sharp, and I can already hear the movement of chairs. Uh, as uh, people are gathering around the table. So I salute you. Thank you again greatly and go to dinner. Have a great dinner. Bye to your family. Bye-bye.